In this module, we will be covering a brief review of some of the regulations that compliance mandates conducting environmental due diligence assessments. The different types of environmental due diligence practices available to an assessor, along with suggested limitations and applicability. And finally, the perspective of different types of clients and their motivations to conduct EDD. The Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act of 1980, or CERCLA, along with the Superfund Amendments and Reauthorization Act of 1986, or CERA, were the first regulatory drivers that pushed real property owners, purchasers, lenders, and others to conduct environmental assessments to demonstrate a diligent effort to know the environmental conditions of a property as a possible protection from liability under these acts. Of importance was the significant concern by the lending community that under CERCLA, lenders could be held liable for the environmental conditions of a property even if the property was merely collateral for a loan. Then, in 1996, the Lender Liability Amendment exempted lenders from environmental liability if their involvement with the property was merely as security. However, they could be held liable if it was demonstrated that the lender played a role, an active role, in the management of the subject property. Up to this time, the rules for conducting all appropriate inquiry was not yet established by the U.S. EPA. ASTM E. 1527 was prepared by the environmental industry to provide guidance on meeting the AAI requirement of CERCLA. With the passing of the Brownfields Act of 2002, Congress gave EPA until 2005 to establish formal rules in conducting all appropriate inquiries. Simultaneously, ASTM was updating E1527 and came to agreement with the EPA that the new version would satisfy a portion of the requirements for conducting AAI under CERCLA. For more information on these acts and regulations, please refer to the history section of this course. A key provision in the Brownfields Act was defining liability protection for innocent landowners, bona fide prospective purchasers, and contiguous property owners. In general, the innocent landowner is someone that conducted AAI and has not found negative environmental conditions prior to purchase and whose operation or activities have not environmentally impacted the property. Bonafide prospective purchasers are protected under the Act if AAI has been conducted prior to purchase and no evidence of environmental impact have been, have been identified. Finally, the adjacent property owner is protected from liability or conditions arising out of a neighbor's activities if it is demonstrated that the impacts on the contiguous property was not generated from the subject property's activities. These categories were somewhat defined under CERCLA, but there was enough ambiguity that the Brownfields Act provided further clarification. One additional note. Although compliance with the All Appropriate Inquiry provision in CERCLA requires the performance of an ASTM E 1527-05 05 ESA, that is only a portion of the tasks required. AAI has additional requirements for the assessment as well as actions to meet contigu continuous obligations on a go-forward basis. So why do people conduct due diligence assessments? The answers to this question are known as the environmental drivers for conducting EDD. These drivers include protecting CERCLA rights by conducting all appropriate inquiries, assessing if environmental conditions exist that may impact the monetary value of the property or future project on the property, screening multiple sites as part of a client's site selection process, or documenting site conditions as a method of assessing 
move-in, move-out conditions as part of a tenant-landlord relationship. Keep in mind these drivers, as we discuss who's conducting environmental due diligence and which methodologies they typically employ. Now that we know what the drivers are, we want to introduce you to a number of approaches or tools to conduct environmental due diligence, each with different levels of due diligence and not all constituting compliance with all appropriate inquiry under CERCLA. The most common tools are the ones you see here in this table, ranging from database reviews to an in-depth assessment beyond the ASTM criteria for a Phase 1, there is something for everybody. The ones here on this page are largely paper studies, with site inspections being an integral part of the Phase 1 ESA and ESA+. Plus. But due diligence may extend beyond the initial site inspection, database review, and historical review to include on-site testing and sampling. Phase 2 ESAs, as defined by ASTM, are conducted to verify if the recognized environmental conditions identified in the Phase 1 are present. Strictly defined, it does not include delineating the extent of contamination, conducting risk assessments, or designing remediation programs. Phase 3 assessments, or additional assessments as most of the industry refers to it, generally include delineation of the contaminants of concern and estimating associated risk. In short, everything needed to design a mitigation or remediation program. In reality, you will see a multitude of variation in the scopes for these types of assessments presented in this table, and it will be up to you and your client to decide the best course of action. Now going to talk a little more in depth about each of these tools.